this is the foundations of well-being. In the bottom left is what we call external conditions, which are the, you know, the, the environment that you find yourself, the social, uh, geographical environment, the material environment you find yourself in. So find yourself in. And in the bottom right is what's called personal resources, which is really you. Uh, you know, this is sort of where you are, this is who you are. And, um, and it's important that we think about these differently, we measure these differently, because it's actually how these things come together that creates well-being. So, you know, why is it that some people thrive in difficult circumstances and other people sink in quite benign circumstances? It's because there's different things going on. We bring ourselves to the party. There's the environment we're in, and then we bring ourselves there. Some people, you know, do manage to achieve great things in very difficult circumstances. Other people manage to achieve absolutely nothing in perfectly benign circumstances. You know, so you know, there's, you know, there's things going on. Out of that emerges, you know, sometimes we talk about it as an emergent property, our feelings uh, and our thoughts about our lives. And there's things we do and then there's things we feel and we think about them. And you can see the sort of energy flowing through this. And it's only when you get to the very top of this diagram that you see a word like happiness start to emerge that you know, it's actually there in the, in the feelings about, about life. Um, a lot of quality of life work has focused on the bottom left box, on, on the external conditions. How do we make livable environments for people? It's very, very important. A lot of psychotherapy, psychological stuff has thought about how do we give people the attitudes, the, how do we study their personalities, their more stable parts. That's in the bottom right. You know, a, a lot of businesses and what do people do? How do they function? You know, uh, and then, you know, the sort of new, new thing on, is actually starting to think about what do people feel about their life, which is at the top there. Very dynamic. There's lots of feedback loops. What we do shapes our environment. We, we interact with it. You know, if you've got someone who's great in your community, they shape the community in a different way that allows the conditions to get better. And just the same, if you have someone that's a pain in the arse in your team, you know it. It affects your environment, you know. So they, we affect it. And feelings affect our sort of more stable parts of our personality over a period of time. You know, if you live in a very, if you're constantly frightened, you know, you're actually going to start to shrink as a person. And you're, you know, your sort of attributes are going to shrink. If you're feeling really good in life, you're actually going to you know, feel confident and expand. And you'll be able to achieve more things, you know, function better. There's energy flowing around the system like everywhere. <laughs> you could probably draw even more feedback loops if you wanted to. Most economists are quite linear in their thinking. Change this in the environment, this will happen. But the causalities are every which way here. So there's all this stuff in, in, in well-being economics, happiness economics, about you know, how much does money make you happy? Well, actually, happy people make more money. You know, the causality runs every way. There's this wonderful study of, uh, you know, which looks at a snapshot of American college photographs. And it just tracks whether people are smiling in them or not. And then it looks 10 years later at how much they earn and how much happy they are in their marriages. And the ones who are smiling in their college photographs are more likely to have successful marriages and earn more money, independent of everything else. And, you know, there's lots and lots of evidence, you know, that, pe that, 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 that happy people generate their own luck, you know, and unhappy people generate their own bad luck. Now, of course, good and bad things can happen to us and huge shocks to the system, which are entirely independent of that. But there again, people who are happy deal better with those shocks, more likely to see a shock as a, a positive thing. You know, we reframe something terrible happens to us. And then about two or three years later, we go, it was one of the best things that happened to me. You know, we wouldn't have asked for it in our life, but you know, positive people reframe things to make them good. Emotions have been understood from psychology, um, you know, having evolutionary purposes. And, and this is a, you know, this is a brutal classification of, of emotions, but there is this talk about five primary emotions a bit like primary colours, that basically there are, you know, and others are mixtures of them. And you can agree or disagree with that, and I really don't think that emotions have evolved quite as tidily as into five groups, but it's a helpful categorization. You know, and they are, the, the, the four so-called negative ones are fear, anger, sadness, and disgust. I always think disgust isn't quite an emotion, but this is how they categorize them. So fear is about a source of danger. Anger is about a violation of some sort, a violation of a norm or a violation of you. Um, uh, uh, sadness is about a loss of support, particularly, which is about saving our energy and then noticing when conditions improve. When sadness gets stuck in depression, 
We're in save energy mode, but we never notice that conditions improve that we then actually start to functionally act again. So grief is a very natural process. It's a healing process for us. It's stay still, you know, just save some energy, collect some things and look for new support. And, you know, and, you know typically, uh, this is quite a brutal statistic, but, but, you know, people who've been widowed, you know, probably have a seven year dip in happiness and start to come out. But you know, it's how do you notice when conditions are improving and you can go out in the world again uh, with sadness. And all of these can get, you know, can get you know, jammed. So mental illnesses, you know, you can have people who get, you know, uh, who are frightened all the time, They're, you know, it's anxiety. People get very, very stuck in that mode and everything is fearful, they're fearful of everything. They, people get very, very aggressive and angry. Um, you know, uh, men tend to more go into anger. Women more into depression, slightly more than men, but obviously both can do. You know, but what about positive emotions? What about happiness, joy, enthusiasm? What are these emotions about from an evolutionary perspective? And this woman who's from California, Barbara Fredrickson, has got probably the, you know, the, the, the strongest uh, theory of what the evolutionary role of positive emotions is about. And, um, and she talks about how when we're in a good mood, uh, when we're, you know, positive emotions are flowing, we broaden our perspective on the world. You know, basically, we're looking out. Uh, uh, you know, fear is, is, is quite narrow. I mean, obviously, when we're detecting as the fear element, we, we, our eyes are very wide, and we're trying to see everything in the environment, but we're looking for threats all the time. And then when we're fleeing, we tend to be focused, and anger is your eyes almost you know, narrow when you get angry. You're happy, and you're looking out at the world. So it's about, it's about creating opportunities. It's about noticing opportunities. Uh, that, that rather than detecting threats. And we pay more attention, we're more creative, we're more playful, we're more open to people, uh, we're more attractive to people. You know, probably most of you met your partner when you were both in a good mood. And that's why happy people, our smile is a signal of our friendliness. It actually says, you know, you can come and approach me if I smile. So of course we create situations where we can, where we can have positive actions more. More able to see the big picture, actually, from a systemic perspective. When you're in a bad mood, you see detail. When you're in a good mood, you see connections. Uh, so, uh, and so, you know, obviously, people who are always in a bad mood tend to look at detail. Cynics look at detail. Cynics argue with you. They always look at the detail of your argument. You always find devils in the detail. <laughs> Optimists look at the big picture. You need a lot more optimistic environmentalists, please, you know, who can look out and see the big picture and see the systems. And these are the uh, five things that we, we came up with. So the first one is connect, which is that our social relationships are the most important thing for our well-being and happiness. I mean, the, you know, the currency of happiness and well-being is our relationships and, and maybe time too, how we use our time. But statistically, two or three times as important as any other factor is our relationships. So, you know, how much do you spend time with loved ones, you know, rather than working too long hours? You know, sometimes we neglect those cornerstones of our lives and uh, you know and why why do we do that you know we, those are the things we should be thinking about and they can be what we call thick relationships which are your close intimate ones and thin ones which are your sort of more distal ones the neighbors the work colleagues they're both important and nourishing to us and can be supportive to us the second one is be active which is that physical activity uh, is great for our happiness our, our short-term mood in fact Probably the fastest way out of a bad mood is to do exercise. People with depression, hardest thing to do is to get them to exercise. But if you can get them to exercise two or three times a week, it's a really good route out of depression. It's obviously very hard. But if people have got mild depression, really, really great for it. The next one is about being engaged with the world, being in part of the world, of, of actually noticing what's going on around you, noticing what's going on with other people around you but actually being engaged, but also not just noticing, you know, noticing sunsets and sunrise beauty, letting yourself be moved by beautiful things, you know, our aesthetic of life, music, films, whatever, you know, actually letting them move you, but also taking notice of what's happening within you, you know, listening to that little voice or the thing that's bubbling up for you, giving it attention. Self-reflection is really, really important for our well-being too. The next one is keep learning. And in a way, this is the most earnest of them. But, but learning throughout the whole life course is great for our well-being. People who are curious, and it's not about knowledge. It's much more about curiosity. It's not about some of our traditional learning environments are not very good for our well-being. But the informal ways of learning are absolutely great. And, it, and this carries on, you know, 
And it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be about um, learning to cook a new dish or, you know, or pick up a hobby you did as a child, you know, again, play a musical instrument again. It doesn't have to be at all formal, but older people who keep learning, who keep curious, have way better health outcomes than those that start to shut down around learning. And the final one is give. Uh, and, you know, evolution is fantastic. We actually feel great when we give. And it's reciprocity working. You can understand the evolutionary roots of giving being important, which is that, you know, we need to have support, so we need to give support. But it's all hardwired. When we give, you know, the right neurons in our brain fire off and we feel great. Lots of evidence around people who volunteer are much happier. Uh, people who say thank you more, more generous. Uh, uh, you know, these are, these are really, really good things. So those are sort of five things that we can do ourselves. But we mustn't forget that there are large systemic things going on. And I want to talk about how those five ways are great, but they don't address the social justice issue. Or they start to, they reframe it in a different way.